Hello guys and welcome to another calculus video. In this video we're going to be taking on the awesome integral that you can see shown right here. Now to be honest this integral can probably best be solved using Feynman's trick and some nice little um, some standard integration techniques but for this integral I decided I wanted to try and learn how to use branch cuts in contour integration because it's something that's uh, really necessary for doing higher level contour, contour integration and it wasn't really something I had learned before. So I went ahead and learned it and practiced with this integral and I can say it's been quite a lot of fun and we're warming up for one of the most incredible integrals that I've ever solved. So this is going to be really fun, lots of cool contour integration, so strap in and let's go ahead and jump right in. So first thing we need to discuss is essentially First off, we're going to be using this definition of the inverse tangent function. You can kind of play around with the definition of natural log to prove that this is going to be true. So i over 2 times the natural log of 1 minus iz over 1 plus iz. Now we kind of need to talk a little bit about branch cuts. So a branch cut is usually going to occur with uh, the function natural log of z. And so if we look at the, I'm kind of showing the domain here of the natural log function, you can see that we have this red line that I've put in here, and that represents the branch cut of natural log of z. And the reason we need a branch cut of natural log of z is because um, if you replace, if you have like e to the z, and then you replace z with z plus 2 pi i, you're going to get the same exact value because e to the 2 pi i equals 1, right? So that means the natural log could return multiple different values, and so we need to decide what value is it going to actually report to us. So usually, we pick, um, we pick our branch cut to be right here on the left, which essentially means that anything that's above this branch cut will be between 0 and pi, and anything that's below the branch cut will be between um, 0 and, or negative pi and 0. And you could also define your branch cut on the positive real axis, and then you would have your argument increasing from 0 to 2 pi as you go counterclockwise. But this is the general way that it's defined, and this is what we're going to be using today since it's easier for us. Now, if we want to define this line, the I'm not sure of really what's the best way to define it, but first off, our branch point occurs, it's basically the starting point of our line, and that occurs at z equals 0, obviously, here. And we could also say, uh, we could define this line as the line for z equals negative alpha, where alpha is a real number greater than 0. So any point that satisfies this um, will be on that branch cut. So when we're doing contour integration, we need our function to be analytic. And what analytic means is basically, uh, it means a lot of different things, but the most important thing is that it's equal to um, its Lorentz series. And we have to be able to use the same Lorentz series throughout the uh, domain of integration, which means that we are not going to be able to uh, integrate on the branch point or over the branch cut. So we need to make sure that our path of integration completely avoids the branch cut. So if we take a look at our functions that we have in our integrand, since we're using that complex definition of arctangent, um, we're looking at natural log of 1 minus iz. And so we're going to set the input of this equal to negative alpha, for alpha is, um, is part of the reals and alpha is greater than 0. And that way we can figure out what our um, branch cut line is going to look like. So for ln 1 minus iz, once we solve for z, after setting this equal to negative alpha, we find that this is going to be negative alpha minus 1 all times i. So that means that our branch point is where alpha equals 0 a is going to be at negative i, or right here in the complex plane, and then the line is going to extend down to negative i infinity. And that's luckily for us not too much of a worry, because usually when we're doing contour integration, we're going to be in the upper half plane. So we actually don't need to worry about ln1 minus iz. But for ln1 plus iz, we have a bit of a different story. And the reason for that is we have to actually completely avoid that line right there. So we have 1 plus iz equals negative alpha. When we solve for it, we get z equals alpha plus 1 times i. So our branch point is at z equals i, and we need to completely avoid this red line, which is the branch cut. And so that's going to be a little bit of a problem, because if we were due to do just a classic semicircle, we would go over that branch cut. So this is how we're going to do it. Consider the contour integral of inverse tangent of z over z times z squared plus 1 fourth dz, which is the integral that we're calculating. This is what our path is going to look like. So it looks a little bit daunting, but it's actually pretty straightforward. Now first off, we have a residue at z equals i over 2, which can be seen by factoring the denominator. 
Notice that there is no singularity at z equals 0, despite we have a z in the bottom here, because inverse tangent of z, if you were right to write out the power series, um, it also has a first order 0 at 0, so those end up being a removable singularity. So we don't have to worry about that. So we're going to go on our real axis right here, and then we're going to start looping up back into the semicircle. We'll call this part of the curve gamma, uh, uppercase gamma 1. Then we're going to jump down um, on the line, which I'll define in a moment, but we're just to the right of the line um, of the imaginary axis right here. And we're going to go all the way down to z equals i. We're going to make a tiny infinitesimally small circle around z equals i because, again, that's a branch point, so we can't go anywhere near that. And then we're going to go back up now just to the left of the imaginary axis, and then finally we're going to complete our semicircle with uh, gamma 2. So this looks a little bit daunting, but luckily most of these parts of our integral are just going to go to zero or be easily evaluable, so we'll only have to deal with a few nasty areas. So let's look at what our integral is going to look like. Okay, so first we're obviously going to be using the residue theorem here, and again, the reason we're allowed to do that is because we're completely avoiding all the branch points and branch cuts, which means that our function is analytic, and most importantly, it also contains our original integral. So that's why we're allowed to use the residue theorem here. So if we if we didn't navigate around those branch cuts, we would still be we would still get um, a result which might help us, but we wouldn't be able to use the residue theorem because um, our function would not be analytic. So um, it's going to be equal to two pi i times the residue of f of z at i over two, which is the only residue or the only pole within our area of integration. And this is just going to be the sum of the different parts of the integral. So that's going to be our gamma 1, gamma 2, our lowercase gamma, our real axis integral, which will evaluate to the integral from negative infinity to infinity of inverse tangent of x over x times x squared plus 1 fourth, which is the integral we're looking for. And then we have this, these two integrals. One of them we're going to be writing as the integral from i infinity plus epsilon to i plus epsilon, where we're taking the limit as epsilon goes to 0 as those two lines get closer and closer to the imaginary axis, if you can imagine. And then we're also taking the same thing, uh, just kind of flipped, and with negative epsilon. So first, let's deal with these two gamma integrals, which we pretty much already know are going to go to zero. I'm not going to do a very formal proof here, but we know that as r goes to infinity, f of z goes to ln r over r cubed. Um, we're talking about the absolute value, of course. And this r is just the radius of that semicircle. So if we look at our definition of f of z again, we're going to have those natural logs. And actually, those natural logs are subtracting each other. So this is going to be um, more of an upper bound situation. And so when we integrate them over gamma 1, uh, both of those have a path length of pi over 2 times r. So we just need to multiply by pi over 2 times r. And then we're essentially going to get that it's on the order of pi ln r over 2 r squared which is pretty easy to see that as r goes to infinity, these both just go to zero. So we don't have to worry about those integrals. Now, our smaller circle integral is a little bit harder to see that it goes to zero, but essentially what we're going to do is we're going to parametrize it. So remember, this is the little integral that goes in a tiny little circle about z equals i, just like that. So we're going, if we set z equal to i plus epsilon e to the i theta, and that epsilon is going to drag out a little circle going in this direction. So we're starting at pi over 2, and we're ending at negative pi over 2. And really, we can actually um, define this a few different ways. Or we're ending... Okay, I actually, I did mess up a little bit here. We're starting at negative pi over 2, and we're going up to 3 pi over 2. But overall, it doesn't actually really matter, because... Um, Essentially, once we plug in z equals i epsilon e to the i theta, we get this long and annoying expression for uh, our function. And I know this looks really, really daunting, but as you let epsilon go to 0, this bottom is just going to be i times negative 3 over 4, right? Because all of these just go to 0. And in the top here, this, is, this term is just going to become ln 2, and this term is just going to become ln epsilon plus some angle, right? But as you can see from our differential, we're also multiplying by i epsilon times e to the i theta. And since epsilon is going to 0, this epsilon right here is going to dominate over everything. It's going to be um, more powerful than this ln epsilon because the limit as epsilon goes to 0 
of epsilon ln epsilon also goes to zero. So we could work out the limit bit by bit, but overall, this epsilon term is just going to dominate and this entire integral goes to zero. So we don't need to worry about that integral. The integrals that we do need to worry about are the straight line integrals going up from i, uh, I to i infinity. So this is our first one. We had the integral from i infinity plus epsilon to i plus epsilon. So we're going to make the substitution, which should be kind of obvious, z equals iv plus epsilon. So then when v equals 1, we get to this point up here. And when v equals infinity, we get to infinity. So we can just go ahead and substitute that directly in and then substitute it directly into our definition. So we get this also kind of nasty expression, but as you guys can remember, we're going to let epsilon go to zero again. And something that you may note is that as epsilon goes to zero, those two integrals become really close to each other. And so it's almost as if you're going down in a straight line and you're coming right back up. So most parts of these integrals are actually going to cancel with each other. And you'll see that in a moment. The only exception to that is um, because of that branch cut that we have, our argument of uh, the natural log is going to jump from pi to negative pi. And you'll see that in a moment. So once we plug everything in, we have this nasty expression right here. And then we're going to let epsilon go to 0. So for this natural log, we're just going to have natural log of 1 plus v. For this natural log, however, we're going to have natural log of 1 minus v plus i epsilon. And the reason having this i epsilon here is important is because if we look at the point i v or 1 minus v plus i epsilon, first off, 1 minus v is going to be negative, right? And epsilon is going to be positive since we're taking the limit uh, from 0 plus, right? And so we're going to be a little bit above this negative real axis as for the input of this natural log. And the reason this is important is that this means that the argument of 1 minus v plus i epsilon is going to be pi rather than um, negative pi because if epsilon was coming was uh, approaching 0 from the negative side then this argument this point would be just below the imaginary axis and our argument would be negative pi so that's the only thing we need to worry about right here we just plug in everything factor out constants and then set epsilon equal to 0 everywhere else and we get this relatively simple expression right here now, this integral is not actually very easy to solve. I'm not sure I would be able to solve it. But as I said, most of the things in this integral are just going to cancel with our other integral, which comes from the other side. So let's go ahead and evaluate that one. So in this integral, we're integrating from i minus epsilon to i infinity minus epsilon. And we're uh, doing this integration. We're just going to make the quite obvious substitution z equals iv minus epsilon. So plugging everything in. We get this, again, very nasty looking expression. But again, we're going to let epsilon go to 0. And again, we need to take a look at the uh, value of this natural log right here, the input. And so in this case, we're actually subtracting i epsilon. And so that means our point lies just below the imaginary axis. And that means that the argument of 1 minus v minus i epsilon is going to be negative pi. And we have to take that into account when we're taking the natural log. So again, when we let epsilon go to 0, Everything's going to simplify a lot. We just end up with some constants times ln 1 plus v minus ln 1 minus v plus i pi. And if we go ahead and take a look at our other integral that we just evaluated, you can see it also goes to ln 1 plus v minus ln v minus 1 minus i pi. Oh, did I make a mistake here? This right here, um, this says 1 minus v, but it actually should say v minus 1 because we are talking about positive numbers here. Uh, sorry about that. So um, you'll notice that everything is exactly the same except for that negative sign and then this pi also changes in sign. And so when we add the two of them together this looks really really nasty but of course everything is just going to cancel and so we can just go ahead and have a little canceling session right here because this will be fun. Cancel, 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 cancel. But these i pi's do not cancel with each other because, again, the only thing that changed when we went from one side of the uh, imaginary axis to the other side of the imaginary axis was the argument of that natural log with this i pi, which switched signs, which is what allowed us to get some value out of this integral. So now this just becomes, once we reorganize everything, this just becomes a very simple real integral. So do partial fractions, and you'll get 
the integral from 1 to infinity of negative 4 over b plus 2 over b minus 1 half plus 2 over b plus 1 half all times pi. Integrating, we get 2 pi times natural log of b squared minus 1 fourth over b squared uh, evaluated at infinity at 1, which ends up being 2 pi times natural logarithm of 4 thirds. Now let's go ahead. We've calculated every single part of our integral except for the real axis integral, which is what we're solving for anyway. And so now all we have to do is calculate the residue and then set everything equal to each other. So the residue at i over 2 is going to be oh, uh, 2 pi i times the residue at i over 2 is going to be 2 pi i times the limit as z goes to i over 2 of f of z times z minus i over 2. So once we factor the bottom, we can go ahead and just cancel those last terms right here. So this is going to cancel with this. And then we can just plug in i over 2 and we're going to get 2 pi i times i over 2 times natural log of 3 halves over 1 half all over i over 2 times i and then you can notice that this i over 2 cancels with this i over 2 this i cancels with this i and this 2 cancels with this 2 so we just get 2 pi natural log of 3 so then to sum everything up we got uh, this is going to be kind of annoying to show because it's a lot of information here but we have our integral, our contour integral right here, is equal to our gamma integrals, which all went to zero, as you remember, plus our i integral, which is our real axis integral, plus these two inter these two kind of weirder integrals, which evaluated to 2 pi natural log of 4 over 3. So we just set everything equal to each other. We get 2 pi ln 3 equals i plus 2 pi ln 4 thirds. Solving for i, we get that i equals 2 pi ln 9 fourths or 4 pi ln 3 halves. So that is quite an interesting result to a very nice looking integral. And honestly, this is one of the most fun integrals that I've evaluated in the past because contour integration is just so much fun. Um, I've always, always been very wary of branch cuts and I've just tried to avoid them. I thought they were the hardest thing in the world to deal with, but honestly, all it takes is, you know, a few days of just looking into materials, looking at examples, and trying to understand the math as much as you can for yourself. And trust me, any math topic that you're uh, that you have the prior prerequisites to learn, you absolutely can learn, and you absolutely can figure out all those problems. You just need to focus a little bit, and uh, you know, put in that work because it is not going to happen easily. But you know, overall, this was one of the best integrals that I've ever solved, and I'm so glad that I decided to just, you know hunker down and figure this stuff out. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this epic contour integration video. Uh, it was so much fun making. And remember, uh, pretty soon we're going to be taking on a very similar integral that has an absolutely stunning result. Absolutely one of the toughest integrals that I've ever done. I worked on it for two months straight. So look out for that video that's coming out soon. Hope you guys enjoy the video and I'll see you next time.